Thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Tucker. I'm the CEO and board member of the Church of the Club. And our program this morning is called Leadership and Innovation the Apple Way. So we're very privileged to have with us Adam Shinsky and Bob Sutton to discuss that topic. And we'll between themselves and then with you, the audience, during the Q&A. Uh, Adam and Bob, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Our thanks also goes to Fenwick and West for opening their doors to us and the beautiful facility that has been open just for two weeks' time. And we're looking forward to doing many programs in the future. Thank you, Fenwick. My last announcement, if you are tweeting this morning, please use the hashtag Churchill Club. And, um, other, I believe there are other Twitter codes in your printed programs. We have lots of new programs in the works for you. You can always find the latest at churchillclub.org. So let's get to the main event. Adam Wyshynski covers Silicon Valley and Wall Street for Fortune. And he is also the author of the acclaimed new book, Inside Apple, How America's Most Admired and Secretive Company Really Works. You can see Adam Weekly on the Fox News Channel, in particular on Kabuto on Business on Saturday mornings. And Adam also co-chairs Fortune's annual Brainstorm Tech Conference, and he hosts the Fortune.com video interview series called Connected. Adam's book will be available, by the way, later today for purchase, courtesy of Books, Inc. Bob Sutton he is Professor of Management Science and Engineering and Professor of Organizational Behavior by Courtesy at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford. He's been teaching management at Stanford since 1983. He studies and is passionate about innovation, leadership, evidence-based management, and workplace civility. His, lit, his last book, The No Asshole Rule, <laughs> Building a Civilized Workplace and Surviving One That Isn't, and current book, Good Boss, Bad Boss, How to Be the Best and Survive the Worst, are New York Times bestsellers. And together with Huggy Rao, Bob is currently writing another book, I believe due out later this year. Next year. Next year, so okay. We finish it. <laughs> On the topic of scaling up excellence, please welcome Adam Lashinsky and Bob Sutton. Thank, thank you so much, Karen. I'll just add one more uh, hashtag, which is hashtag inside Apple and uh, a Twitter handle, which is at Adam Lashinsky. Do you want to add anything to that? I barely understand that stuff, even though it's two guys out there. And um, Bob, just, I'm just curious to start things off. How much do you love it when someone like Karen Tucker says asshole publicly? Yeah, well, I, I think it's good and bad, actually, to tell you the truth, because it's a sign of our instability in our society. But on the other hand, it, it is an effective and necessary word sometimes. So, so I have mixed feelings. And given our topic today, I love the fact, first of all, that your bio includes the expression by courtesy, uh, re referring to one of your appointments, and also that civility is one of the topics that, that you cover because when we talk about the leadership style and the, the management style at Apple, civility and courtesy wouldn't necessarily be two of the first words that would come to mind. Yeah, I, I understand that, that from reading your book, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm, my, my task, so, so you all understand, this is a, a, a wonderfully different format for most public venues in that we're, Bob and I are actually going to have a conversation with you eavesdropping on us, and then we'll bring you into the conversation as opposed to what would more normally be me interviewing him or, or him interviewing me. And uh, I will frame the conversation by making a few observations about Apple. And... Apple's a fascinating topic for everyone in this room and for where we are, it, and, and if you think of it in a historical sense, in that 25 years ago, Apple was this incredibly important company. Uh, innovative, maverick, changed the world of fascinating, two fascinating co-founders and so on. And then for all intents and purposes, not for everybody around here, but for everybody else, then it went away. I mean, it fell into irrelevance. When I arrived in the Valley in 1997, it was a, a kind of a small, unimportant, faded icon that everybody around here was very, very worked up about, but nobody in the rest of the world much cared about, especially business people. They didn't use Apple products. And then began the next 15 years. And, and here we are today, it's a, what, far more than $500 billion market cap company, much bigger than ExxonMobil by market capitalization. And so, 
we ask the question, how did Apple, the questions, how did Apple get there, here, and what makes Apple so different from, uh, from, from every other company in, in the world? And I'll offer just a few observations and, and then get you to react to them, Bob, which is, sure. so it is, you know, my thesis is that Apple does business differently from many or most other companies and in fact breaks the rules of business. So business leaders are supposed to uh, be empowering and nurturing of their, of their people beneath them. And we know that for the last 15 years before his death, Steve Jobs was not particularly empowering. He was a micromanager and he was not a nurturer. He was a, he was a dictator in the, in the corporate sense. Um, massive companies are, are, um, are, are divisionally oriented, not, uh, are, structured, are, are divisionally structured, not functionally structured the way Apple is, astounding for a company uh, of its size. And then there's the, there's the issue of secrecy, that every company has secrets, and at Apple everything is a secret. And the astounding thing is, I think everyone understands intuitively, because in the business world, that you keep secrets from your competitors and you keep secrets from your customers too until you're ready to give them the product. The difference is that Apple keeps secrets from its own people and they have this elaborate culture that we can discuss about how if you and I both work at Apple but we work on different teams, then your business is none of my business and my business is none of your business. Different from any company I've seen. As a matter of fact, recently someone who worked for years at the NSA told me that Apple reminds him of, of the National Security Agency. <laughs> Except their secrecy is probably worse than Apple's. Um, let, let me start out with a, a few reactions. That's a pretty long list, so we might want to go back and forth. And, um, and I don't want to disagree with Adam, but I guess I'll disagree with him a little bit. And that to me, Apple is is really almost a classic centralized, or as uh, uh, one of my friends John Lilly would say, genius-driven organization. And, and throughout the history, if you look up not just U.S. industry, but worldwide industry, there has always been centralized organizations with a few very um, powerful people at the top where all the lines um, went to them. And I, I even frankly see it a little bit in my own university. It's a little bit of John Hennessy's management style, if you, if you want. And, and John is a great dean and now a university president, but John says yes and no and he's the boss. So, he, so we see that a little bit. You also. I don't think it's any accident that Larry Ellison and Steve Jobs are such good friends. It's another sort of um, centralized organization. And, and the thing that, I, the lesson at least that I take away from Adam's book and from other things that I've heard and read from Apple and the secrets that people whisper to you um, because they work there or they're involved, but then they, and, and I get this all the, used to get this all the time when I was working on, the, on um, my book, The No Asshole Rule, and other times people would say, well, let me tell you the story, but if you name me, I'll kill you, is usually what they would say, um, including at least one well-known lawyer from this law firm, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, anyways, um, but, but the, 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 the beauty to me, and the interesting thing about, about Apple is it's a pretty good, pure, de pure centralized organization, and I see the pieces as sort of fitting together. So if you're gonna have a command and control organization, and even though we all love empowerment and democracy and all that sort of stuff, the, the fact is that um, if all the pieces fit together, command and control is, is fine, as long as the people at the top are telling you the right things to do. And another thing about Apple, and then I think I'll, I'll sort of add this and get Adam's reaction that really does strike me, if you have a relatively small cabal of people who are running an organization, it's very important that things don't get too complicated because, um, because what ends up happening is that they'll get cognitively overloaded really quickly. So if you look at it, and the classic to me, Silicon Valley decentralized firm, and they've changed so much that they don't resemble what they used to be, but in the good old days at Hewlett Packard when they had some 70 decentralized divisions, where the general manager was king and was on his or her own P&L, and they were very successful. And, and, and the way that Hewlett and Packard used to run Hewlett and Packard, um, especially David Packard, was through what friends of mine who worked there, and I worked with them, they called the mafia model. You would run your business uh, as general manager, and if you had um, great numbers, they'd leave you alone. If you had kind of weak numbers, you'd get some help from management. And if you had bad numbers, they'd shoot you. And they, in these days, they wouldn't do layoffs, but it was a decentralized structure with some 50 to 70 P&Ls. 
And then, as I understand from Adam's book, only one person has a PNL, the CFO, is that correct? An Apple, yeah. And, 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 and so, so, just to me, um, the Apple model works and will continue to work, and, and we should dig into this, so long as the people at the top can deal with the, met, the level of um, cognitive load, and as long as they're smart enough to keep making the right decisions. So, um, by the way, the, uh, to, to update your mafia, to update your mafia, and one of my favorite television programs that ended a few years ago was The Wire on HBO. And what you're saying is that the old Hewlett Packard model is that everyone could have their own corner. Yeah, but that's exactly right. which to deal drugs. But if your numbers weren't good, and they would, that was one of the fascinating things about the program. They would have these business conversations, and in fact. Well, the number two leader in the show went to night classes to learn about business and accounting and whatnot. Mm -hmm. He would explain to the you know the young drug the young gangbangers running the corner, you got to make your numbers. Uh, so you're right. So 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 I, so I think, but I, I but, but to me that's just another structural example. Truly, I'm digressing here. <laughs> but I think it's the same point actually. Um, but so I so I'd appreciate you sort of commenting on that because I. I see them as is, is actually a brilliantly centralized form. It, it just and even that fact that and I was just amazed. One one person in the organization has a PL, look at the biggest organization in the world in terms of money. It's sort of amazing. So let's let's dig into a bunch of these things. One of the um, first of all, Apple's a company of paradoxes. So you, you raise a very interesting point. It is on the one hand you know, maverick, and they do things differently from everybody else. They try to make products that are different from everyone else's, and yet, some of the things they do are such basic business from the way somebody would have assumed business would have been done a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago. So, this notion of having, of, of having a, a concept of a DRI, the directly responsible individual, the person who is responsible for a specific task. Uh, is there anything astounding about that? The only thing astounding about that is that other is that every other company in the world doesn't do it. I mean, it's exactly the way you would raise a child, right? Your job is to make your bed, and you have to make your bed, and that's that's the way it works at Apple. Um, as far as I, I love your expression, cognitive cognitive overload, because, uh -huh. because as I told you the other day, that's a, a, a fancy way to me of describing something that I've observed observed, which is so. First of all. Apple is notoriously simple. The products are simple by design, but so is the company. The structure is simple. And the number of things they do, at least have done, is simple. And we should put a pin in, if, do we, if we have time, to have a discussion about is the company becoming far more complex than it, than it used to be, and is that going to be a problem? But at least if we're looking back over the last 15 years, very simple, relatively few products going on at once. And get, think again about this internal secrecy. Because I can't pay attention to what you're doing, because it's against the rules, it's against the culture, I also can't play politics. I also can't get distracted. I can't have cognitive overload. Um, and and I, I think one of the things you're, you know, you're hinting at, we're talking about you know, leadership and can people emulate Apple. <laughs> and you're saying, yes, if you have as simplified a structure as Apple does. I refer to this as the don't, try, don't necessarily try this at home factor. <laughs> Not every company can do it Apple's way. But more companies, I think, ought to be asking, can we do it? Can we be more like well, Apple? Well, so, so even in a, the, the most decentralized organization, <laughs> I would argue, and this is one thing Huggy and Rao and I have been looking at, when you look at organizations that scale well or scale um, out um, organizational change as well, they tend to do it in such a way that they're relatively simple, and you know what you're supposed to do and know what you're not supposed to do. Another thing, when we were talking about this on the phone earlier in the week, one thing that you see at Apple, which I do think is a general principle, is, is in um, organizations that do things well, it tends to be very clear what's sacred and what's profane. Like there tends to be very little ambiguity, and so we were talking about secrecy, and obviously at, at Apple, secrecy is absolutely an incredibly sort of sacred thing. And just sort of up the street here somewhere, we have Mozilla of Firefox fame, and that's an organization I work with a lot. That's an organization where actually secrecy is quite profane, and it's very clear because they're an open source um, a company that's a, and they're a for-profit organization wholly owned by a nonprofit. So that's another thing that's interesting to me about it. And in, the, in this notion of cognitive load, you might want to think in your organizations, big organizations, one thing that, that they tend to have to do is go through periods of renewal, 
where they start stripping out the stuff that distract people, are unnecessary. And you always hear, um, hear lines like the skeletons in the closet scraping off the barnacles. So, so I think those are some of the lessons that you can learn from Apple. And I, and I honestly see Apple is less distinct um, than, than you do because there have been other great centralized companies. And, and, uh, and I have one thing, I think it's interesting that the, the one board that um, Tim Cook is on is Nike, is that correct? I, I read that in your book, it must yes, be true. That's right. um, Nike is the exact opposite. They're amazingly decentralized. There, there's no way that Phil Knight or any human being can know all the products that they have out in the world at once. They just send all this stuff out there and they let the market act. So, but, but, but they do this thing of giving people the power to have, if you will, their own P&L for the product. So to me, it, it isn't a matter of what's better, centralization or decentralization. The, the question is, do you implement, implement the model properly? So, so Bob, I have a bunch of comments, but before I make them, what name a company that is that, that, an excellent company that is highly centralized the way Apple is? Uh, Chevron, um, and I, I don't like these companies, but you start looking at all the major energy companies. I try to be non-judgmental in my in my analysis of, of these companies. I don't like or dislike any of them. Well, I have tenure, so I can say this. Um, so, um, I do not have tenure. Okay, yeah, it's it's, re it's really a stupid concept, but I'm enjoying it. Um, but how we're digressing. But we should we should. I'm going to write that down because you know uh, longevity is an interesting. And, 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 and I'll give, give you another example. Uh, you know, my, my father during World War II was in Patton's army. You talk about Patton was sort of like the Steve Jobs of his period, that all lines went to Patton and Patton made all major decisions no matter how much trouble he got in. And sort of like Steve Jobs, he got sort of kicked aside for a while too. But, and he sort of but hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna push you a little bit because let's discard the army because it's a very good example of a command and control structure, but it's not a company. Zynga. Um, <laughs> Very young, so I don't think it counts. And uh, Chevron, is like two, three products at most at Chevron. Facebook. So, sorry, I I, 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 I want a big establishment, successful company that has stood the test of time from you that is as centralized as Apple. Um, I, I can't quite get there because it's the biggest one, but, but what, the Catholic Church? Again, excellent, <laughs> excellent comparison. Umberto Eco, I think, was the first to publicly make the comparison between uh, uh, Apple and the Catholic Church, and I'm not sure if our comparison at the top is if Steve Jobs is being compared to Jesus Christ or to the Pope. I'm not, I don't, I'd have to go back and read it. But again, not a fair comparison. But, 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 but the, the reason your question is so easy, I, I could, we, we are of a similar ethnic persuasion because Adam and I, we start arguing immediately. Um, but, but Loving each other but, for it. And yes, a, a loving sort of conflict. But, but actually, another organization, weirdly, if you look at how Hollywood works, it tends to be the same, but, but to also add to Adam's question, like the large organization, that's, they, they, they all die off or get in massive trouble. If you look at changes through the Fortune 500 so, or, or the Fortune 50, um, organizations just sort of rotate in and out. And, um, and, and you could also make the argument of, if, if you're gonna say, find the decentralized organization that's as successful um, as, as Apple or as large, it actually would be sort of difficult to do too. So, so to, to add this point where I would agree with them, that in terms of a pure type of uh, what my friend John Lilly calls a genius-driven centralized organization that's actually possible to manage, I think that, that Apple is, is as successful as an organization has ever been, but, but, but they also do things that weren't possible in the past, like outsourcing, what is it, 1.5 million jobs to Foxconn? So that, so that gets rid of the cognitive complexity in the past um, with Ford Motor Company, another very centralized organization, by the way, under Henry Ford, who was completely in charge. Um, but, um, but in the past, he'd have to deal with the labor force in a way that, uh, that Apple doesn't. So on the theme of, of leadership, I'm going to step back from this. Oh, good. <laughs> you can argue about that, too. Um, <laughs> Stepping back? No, no, no. Okay. So, you know, so it's interesting you talk about a genius-led organization and, and centralization, and there are jobs, and it's, it's very important, the, the important and, and mysterious conversation about Apple is to try to unwind Apple from Steve Jobs, and it's, it's no easy task, and most people get it wrong in one direction or the other, maybe including me, because on the one hand, there's been too much overstating of his of his influence, and that you will. The popular conception is, as we were talking about earlier, is that well, he's responsible for everything. 
On the other hand, you can't understate how central he was to what happened over the last 15 years. But there were a lot of metaphors used to describe him, and I think they're instructive to this concept, to these, to this discussion of leadership and centralization. So, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll save my favorite one to last. So he was called a curator. A curator. Um, he's like an orchestra conductor. He would conduct. He knew the score of what everybody was playing, but everybody else didn't know the scores of the people who are, who are elsewhere in the orchestra. My favorite is editor. So. He behaved as CEO of Apple very much like a magazine editor. And a magazine editor chooses what stories are going to go in the magazine. If they're very good editors, they choose the best pieces to go in the, edit in the magazine, thinking about what's best for the reader, not the feelings of the writer or the editor or the photographer and so on. These are very difficult decisions to make. And I think human beings are bad at these types of decisions, especially organizational human beings. They want to satisfy lots of stakeholders or constituents, especially their employees. And what, what, I, what I find that Apple has done so well, and we could have a different hour and criticize Apple and criticize what it doesn't do well, but I believe for all the spin and the propaganda that Apple absolutely makes decisions based on what is best for the customer. And then somebody will jump up and say, but they don't include such and such, and I want such and such. Said, well, they, they made that decision. They knew there were trade-offs, and they made that decision for you. And that's Apple. Um, so, and I think it takes centralization to enforce that. That's why I think it has worked for Apple, and I'm still, and I'm still puzzled by how other companies, I think other companies, for a wide variety of reasons, including bureaucratic garbage who lose sight of the customer. That's sort of a truism. We all know it in our, you know, we all have that, we instinctively know that so many businesses are bad at thinking about their customers, but I still don't know why. And so I've been trying to describe, if not explain, how Apple does think about its customer. So, so I, I think that's actually an excellent observation, and, and it makes me, Think of a couple of things. So, if we think back to Apple when Adam first arrived in Silicon Valley in the mid '90s, '96, '97, um, one of the problems they have, and this is when power and politics go bad, is they had a huge line of it's like performers. They had this huge line of um, of computers, a, a zillion different laptops and desktops, and that was it wasn't that old giant handheld thing that failed. What was Newton? That? The Newton. Um, all sorts of things, and, and one of the reasons was that you had a whole bunch of medium power groups at Apple, um, each of which had enough power to come up with its own product line, but not enough power to kill the other's product line. And so, and, and so in that case, if you will, editing wasn't possible because everybody didn't have enough power, and, and, and there's a number of large companies that I work with that you see this sort of notion. Uh, it's one of the things that actually led to the, well, the demise of General Motors, and then we um, helped get them back as U.S. taxpayers. Uh, having worked with General Motors, some um, they had a whole bunch of, of um, you know, businesses that had enough power to produce, well, something like the Oldsmobile or the Saturn, but not enough power to squish everybody else. So that's important. But but to go back to Adam's point about the editor, there are other industries where we know this happens. The fashion industry. So if you've ever seen the Devil Wears Prada, it's no accident that um, Anna Wintour, I think is her name, and Steve Jobs are sort of similar characters because you, because the personality aside, you probably need that. And then even Pixar, the nicest, so, so Pixar, they actually will let you in and let them talk to you sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. The, the nicest people in the world, nonetheless, there's this person called the director, which is the most important person in Pixar. And although in Pixar, there's a group um, of fellow directors who will write you notes. In the end, you, if you are a director, Andrew Stanton um, or Brad Bird, you have ultimate authority of what's in The Incredibles. That's how that's how it works. And and, and, I, and I sort of and there's one other thing that Jobs does that I think or did that I think is really important to bring out, and, and something to me that infects the culture still. Um, and this notion at Apple, it seems to me, although financial incentives are certainly part of the deal, and, and this comes from Adam's book and from other cases, and certainly runs through Pixar is the primary motivators are pride and shame, not money. And I really, that's one thing I really got from your book. And, and, and one thing that it reminded me of is that a conversation with a guy named Tom Porter, who's a senior guy 
um, at Pixar, and, and the Pixar Apple comparison we could get into because that's an interesting one as well. And Tom Porter described to me how um, he was working on that film uh, Monsters Inc. Remember Monsters Inc.? And I don't remember the name of the character, but there was a big blue monster that had, that was voiced by um, by Goodman, John Goodman. Sully. Sully. Okay. So John, Tom Porter's job was to do Sully's fur. Okay. And he said Jobs would walk up to me constantly and say, Tom, when Sully appears on the screen, because fur is really hard for an animated movie because of the way it moves. When it gets wet, it has to take on different characteristics. What you're going to do is you're going to look up and say, See that fur? That's mine. Isn't that fantastic? Look, what a great job I did. And he said, I was driven by that in the back of my mind the entire time. And I think this pride and shame thing in Silicon Valley, I think we talk about money too much and pride and shame not enough. So, by the way, uh, that would be, I would, that, that's a wonderful anecdote, which I've never heard before. And I would file that, my instinct tells me I would file that in the category of the Steve Jobs X Factor that that one cannot learn. You, you can try to emulate that, but that brilliance, it, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, I, I, you know, I do a lot of television, I have producers who have a gift for uh, a, 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 literally 20 seconds before the red light is about to go on, they will crack a joke in my ear, and it's just the right joke to loosen me up. It's a different emotion than this pride or, pride or fear or, or, or shame, but he was a natural at that sort of interaction, right? But let's, I wanted to, you brought up money a couple times, uh -huh. so I want to talk about two leadership um, topics. One is money, and, but, but the, large, the meta topic is culture. And I'm having, uh, I'm having an epiphany recently that I think for the first 20 years of my career that I thought that culture was a, a squishy topic, a soft business topic. And, after spending the last year studying Apple and thinking a lot about what I love about the culture of Fortune magazine as well, I've decided that I was completely wrong. It may be, well, it may be a squishy topic, but it's an extremely important topic. And let's just take one example of the Apple culture, which is that we know now that the jobs frowned on the, on the discussion of money, almost in an aristocratic blue blood way, but, but different, right? So you just thought it was a, a petty topic. But from a business perspective, you, you all, as an Apple employee, you don't think, you are not allowed to think at any early stage of a product's development, how much money is this going to make? Or can I afford to make it? This is a cultural aspect of Apple driven by, driven by jobs. And it's incredibly powerful. So I can think of, and I'm, I, I'm gonna be like you for a moment and not name them. I can think of two companies off the top of my head that where it was brain dead obvious to me what the, that the company needed to kill a profitable product, a highly lucrative product, because it was a bad product, and it was embarrassing them, and it was hurting the, strat the strategic direction of the company, and the managers didn't have the courage to lose the revenue. Well, Apple will say, we don't care about revenue. No, easy, easy to say in 2012, but, that, but Apple thought that way when it didn't have an abundance of revenue. And, and I think this is, this is both an example, a really good example of culture, and then at a more tactical level, that this, I think every company could say, do we think about revenue optimization first, or do we think about delighting the customer first? And I don't know, I think the business world would be a better place if, and I know this is idealistic, if everyone said, you know, let's just do what the cust what's best for the customer and assume that we're going to make boatloads of money doing that. Well, naive? Is that naive? Well, I, I don't think, I actually agree with you for the most part that if, if you sort of focus on actually doing the right thing, and so to me that's, if you've ever, so there's a great old philosophy book called uh, Zen and the Art of Archery, and, and the point of, the, of Zen and the Art of Archery is, is essentially, if you don't think about hitting the target, you think about every little step that's required to uh, pick the bow, to string it, to draw it back, and uh, you don't even think about aiming, but if you do all the steps right, you'll hit the target anyways. And if you just keep thinking about the target, you won't hit it because you won't go through all the little steps. And what, sort of what I'm hearing from Apple is they knew, because money's just an end state that, that shows whether you've done well or badly in the marketplace. So, so I, I think that's a kind of zen sort of approach to business. 
And, and to go back to Pixar, which I'm thinking is an, is an example, that, that they do a very good job also of thinking about doing the right thing. And, and I, but I do think it's also time to talk about Google a little bit because like sometimes people talk like Google isn't doing great. Like when I look at the stock and I look at the market share, Google's doing pretty good. And to me, um, Google sort of gets to um, what matters to customers in a different way. And uh, th then to rely on my buddy, uh, John Lilly Still, he describes Google as a data-driven organization. So this gets back to your culture thing. One of the ways that Huggy and I have been thinking about culture is in, um, in strong culture organizations, it's clear what's sacred and what's profane. I'll just tell you about this is a, 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 a raging debate within Google at the moment. I don't disagree with anything you said, but they're, they're at a they're at a crossroads in how they serve the customer, and there's uh, there's great dissent within. There's a, a, a an engineer recently left who wrote a blog piece uh, three weeks ago that said why I left Google. It's a, it's a flawed but extremely interesting, extremely interesting piece. Well, that, that's also what you get with a decentralized organization. There's always been great dissent in, and an organization that encourages debate. You're right. But 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 let me talk about the evidence based notion because. It, because and one thing, again, I get from your book in particular is Apple is not particularly evidence-based in a traditional sense. Google is so evidence-based. Well, first of all, they study everything. Their HR analytics group, they study just in massive detail how to manage people. And, they, and of course, the A-B testing, just like absolutely like crazy. And, and to give you an example, and I, I just heard this from a woman who was doing a story for BBC, like they even do stuff like in the cafeteria, they're trying to get people to drink um, less sort of like soft drinks and more waters. So what they're doing is they're arranging um, where the drinks are so that the, the soft drinks are sort of at the bottom and hard to get to. And they're, they're showing there's a 42% drop in the consumption of like sugared water. I mean, it's, it really is an organization that thinks from an evidence-based perspective. And they're not just trying to make money. That, that's to them, that's the route to money. Yeah, it, you know, I hear that anecdote. And I, first of all, I, I believe that, that this is driven by Sergey Brin. And Larry Page is also very interested in this, but Sergey Brin is, is obsessed with yeah. these sorts of things. And it strikes me as more than a little insane, but no more insane than Jobs arguing with a marketing executive about whether a comma or a semicolon was appropriate in an email going out sure. to describe a new product, or Jobs obsessing over the type of screw used on the inside of the early Macintoshes, as, as David Kelly describes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I wanted to go back to something that uh, when, when we were talking about, you know, I, I, one of our topics this morning is leadership, right? So I wanted to talk about motivation. And it occurred to me, this is a topic that I give a lot of thought to over the years for personal reasons. So you, Steve Jobs, and I have one thing in common, maybe only one thing in common. Well, we all lived in California at some point. But we all, um, we all, uh, uh, the three of us and many other people do something we love. Uh -huh. And we chose to do it because we wanted to do this. <laughs> and we could have made more money. Now, he became a multi-billionaire. But I would submit that he didn't set out to become a multi-billionaire. He set out to do the things he wanted to do. You Institutionally, you get this sense from Apple people, too. I spoke to many Apple people who came in the early 2000s, for example. And a, a common comment would be, uh, my friends thought I was crazy to join that shitty company. Um, I didn't do it for the money, that's for sure, because I wasn't getting a great, I wasn't getting a great salary, and I never thought all those stock options would be worth much. These people made tens of millions of dollars at, at a certain level. Um, they did it because they believed they were going to have a great experience. Now, I don't know how people in leadership and management can extrapolate that observation to say how can we motivate our people by things other than money, but I think it is a valuable goal. Well, I don't know if you teach that in business school, for example. Well, I, I, I'm just, I'm tenured in the engineering school. And, 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 and in fact, that comparison is interesting because I often teach groups that are composed of engineers and business folks. And, and there's something about MBA education, there's actually evidence to support this, that makes um, people more focused on money and less focused on intrinsic rewards. Um, 
quite, it's quite well documented. The more training people have in economics and business, the more they think about money and the less they think about the joys of the work. And it, it is interesting that um, very few of our great Silicon Valley companies were started by people who had MBAs. Well, it's really interesting because we know that Jobs was biased against against MBAs and against the MBA education. And, and, and I sort of teach that stuff, so I'm damning myself when, when I say that. But, but th there are, to me, a couple of things that you can look for. One is the notion of just not talking about money unless it's absolutely necessary. And, and one of the ironies of money, and my colleague Charles O'Reilly, who we've discussed, has this argument that money is so important that you can't talk about it too much because it just gets so vivid and motivates us so much and distracts us so much. When you talk about it too much, all that happens is that people start doing the wrong things for, for the wrong reasons. The, the other thing, and it's interesting, so earlier in the week I was talking uh, to a, a friend of mine, his name is Michael Deering, he's very successful early stage uh, um, uh, um, venture capitalist. His last job is he was head of eBay North America. Michael's funded 62 companies in the last four years, and I got kind of physically sick because my wife and I, who are here, we turned down the opportunity to invest in his fund, which has 80% um, year over year internal rate of return. Try finding that with your money. We're getting 1%. Anyways, so I was talking to Michael, and, and so it's Michael, what do you look for? when you? And, and, and so he had these numbers. He interviewed 2,400 entrepreneurs um, to, to fund 60 companies. And two of the things actually um, are consistent with what you're talking about. One is, he, he really doesn't want them to talk about money. He wants to talk about customers, um, ease of use, and so um, thing, things that are sort of like focused on actually the intrinsic of the job. The other thing which you haven't brought up, which was uh, very jobs-like and may not describe you and I quite as well, is this, this notion that um, you're willing to take risks and believe there's something special about you where you're gonna, you're gonna succeed. And so what Michael looks for when he interviews is that he wants to see some evidence in their life that they've turned down a sure, safe thing in exchange and went after something that's high risk. Like, like did, did, you, did you leave a job at Microsoft and go off and do a startup? And, and certainly, when you, when you look at um, jobs, you saw that um, time and time again, and, 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 and there's this, also this notion of so much optimism, it's actually almost insane. And so we're talking about David Kelly, who at IDEO did a lot of products for jobs. And he said one of the characteristics, so if you're a product designer, one of the ways that you charge clients is, is the client has to estimate how many units are going to be manufactured. And, and one of the things that, that um, Kelly said about jobs, every product they ever designed for them, jobs thought was going to like, sell like 10 million. So, which actually really raises the cost because you've got to do it, but, but this idea of sort of specialness and a willingness to take risk, which by the way has a downside because by definition risk, um, usually you lose. So two, so two things, and then we're gonna go to Q&A. Okay. Um, number one, Apple is a, is a risk-taking company, even at its great size, it, it, it makes enormous bets famous case study on this. I don't know if anyone's literally written it as a case study, but they could because it's actually been disclosed in securities filings, is the multi-billion dollar forward purchase of DRAM memory that, that, uh, that Tim Cook was responsible for. But when Apple made the transition from uh, disk drives to, to flash in the iPod, that decision, that purchase, was predicated on selling an astronomical number of units. Had, it, had the unit volume not worked out, then the bet would have been a multi-billion dollar loss. Um, second thing, my observation is, and this is one of the many paradoxes of Apple, is that um, now joining Apple as an employee is not a terrible risk to your career. And so there, uh, there's a risk, but it's not a big risk. You're joining a successful, established company that pays well and has great benefits and all that, and it is almost certain to succeed in the marketplace because of its tremendous power. Anyway, uh, that's going to be a paradox for Apple. We, sh we, should, um, we, we should take questions from anybody who wants to ask them. Do we have a mic? Yeah, we have a microphone. Okay. <laughs> uh, on, on the topic of risk, um, you know, leadership in this genius-driven, centralized organization that you're describing, how are younger leaders recognized and brought along? And does that scale? Do you want to comment generally first? No, I think you should comment about Apple, because my understanding is that, uh, again, under uh, when Jobs was in control, 
uh, he would identify uh, the he would identify leaders who he thought should be should be brought up, and he had two primary mechanisms for bringing them up. Uh, one was that for a variety of reasons, he would invite them to attend uh, executive committee, executive team meetings, or, or executive or high-level product review meetings, or other meetings. He was another paradox for such a maverick. He was a meeting person. And uh, he would invite you to attend the meeting, whether you had a role or not, and then he would invite you to sit there. And then when he was done with you, when he decided that it was time for you to leave, he would say, go now, you're, you're done. But and, and if you knew that you were moving up, if you were invited back to more meetings, and more meetings and to stay longer and to stay longer. That's one. And then the other more formalized mechanism that he had is called the top 100 at Apple is a group of the hundred people that Jobs described as the Apple people he would want in a life raft if the good ship Apple were sinking with him to go recreate the company elsewhere. Very biblical, right? And, uh, and the interesting characteristics about the top 100 is that it wasn't necessarily based on rank. Uh, your, your title did not ensure your attendance at a top 100 meeting. And these were actual physical meetings that happened at some remote site in the Santa Cruz or Monterey Bay area where he would require these powerful executives to be bussed down on a, on a bus from Cupertino. They couldn't drive their own cars. They weren't supposed to tell anybody they were going and put it on their calendar. They, um, when they got there, he would make sure that the, the room was swept for bugs because he didn't want, the, the, he had the fear of, 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 competitor, of competitors bugging the room. Uh, in, in the very last one, he would refuse to have uh, any conversation going on while food servers were in the room. For fear that they would be they would be spies. Um, anyway, at these top 100 meetings, he would reveal to given if you remember, given that really only about 10 people would know everything that was going on at the company at any one time, this would be a, about an annual opportunity for a slightly larger group of people to understand what was coming down the pike, the roadmap. So these are some of the tactics that he used for, for management. And it's funny to hear about the you know the method behind HR at Google because. Jobs was openly dismissive about HR. He believed in recruiting, he did not believe in HR. He, he would say nasty things about the function. And they went through one vice president after another. Yeah. The, the current vice president has no business experience, has never run a, an HR department in his life. Yeah. Yeah. Joel Benoni, I know him pretty well. He was a dean at Stanford, and actually, actually a great guy. Um, just to add a little bit to what Adam described, if you, if you listen to Adam, you hear nothing of anything like a formal mentoring program, like training people in terms of management skills, which is what, I mean, if you look at like the great, um, you know, sort of divisionalized companies like, uh, well, you look Packard in the old days, but General Packard Electric. and Gamble, General Electric, like they have, uh, they have a whole university and everything. And, um, it, and, and as long as, as the organization can be ran with just a few people, that's fine. But, as it gets more and more complex, I do worry about people not having enough management skill. And it's interesting, Joel was only was already mentioned. The reason that um, uh, Joel talked to me once when he got the job and he told me he was never going to talk to me again, and he has kept his word. He doesn't answer my emails. I send them every now and then for fun. Um, but he was brought in to start something called Apple University, which was to sort of begin to more formally develop management talent. And from what I can tell, although I don't have very good information, I think that's gone to the wayside pretty quickly. Um, and, and so the risk of Apple, there's two risks. There's risk is that if they actually need more broad management skills and information throughout the organization, it's sort of a problem. So if you're pointing at the wrong airplane crash at the wrong time, they really could have very serious problems. And, and, then, and then the other problem with Apple is if, when, and, and I got this from your book and I've heard this other places, is when you go to another company, there's all these skills you don't have that, that like uh, people who worked, let's say, for McKinsey for two years have um, in spades that are just like basic stuff that come with sort of managing money and doing marketing and having a broader sense of what, budget. Man, bu yeah. bu of, of what it is to be, um, to be a, a manager. So um, I don't think it's gone to the wayside quite as much as, 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 it, as you may think, but I think they, we, it's very hard to know since it's very hard to know. And Bob got a good laugh line from everyone where he said that uh, you know Joel only doesn't answer his emails and he sends one from time to time just for larks. And it is funny, but it is very consistent behavior across the board, across the company. I met someone recently who told me 
that uh, her son-in-law works at Apple and he was currently on a trip to Hong Kong and her daughter has no idea why because this man does not tell his wife what his business is in Hong Kong. Next question. Yeah, you guys talked about um, the ability to uh, focus on the customer and how that uh, kind of competes with focusing on internal politics and Bob, you mentioned um, cognitive overwhelm. Right. And I'm wondering if in a single company, if the focus on the customer and the focus on internal politics, in fact, conflict with each other, and if it's possible to have a company where you can do both, uh, because it seems like that's a problem with a lot of, I've worked with a lot of different companies as a marketing consultant, and I see that issue happening all over the place. Well, well first of all, there are many, many large companies in America where you don't survive unless you can do both. Uh, and I, I, I'll pick one, which I actually think is a great company, is Procter & Gamble. Parker Gamble really is, is in many ways a great company, but the other company I've worked with and I'm allowed to talk about, nobody will shoot me, um, and, and, and under especially A.G. Lafley, who I, I knew, that there were very clear things you had to do to be effective politically, but one of them was under A.G. Lafley, the notion of the customer being boss and being more customer focused was one of the things you needed to do to get ahead politically, but where it gets dysfunctional is where it becomes one of these I win, you lose games. Uh, I think of the old Citibank um, under John Reed was very much this way, that, that the way you got ahead is it didn't matter about the customers. Your whole job was to, was to like stomp on people and, and get ahead independently of the effect on the company's profitability or customers. They didn't care about customers at all. Ask my mother, she's a Citibank customer. She still hates them and she should. So play politics, it's okay as long as you're playing politics on behalf of the customer. I, I, well, at least partly on behalf of the customer. And, 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 I, and I do think that, that Procter & Gamble under A.G. Lafley was a pretty good model. There were certainly imperfections that he shifted the political game so the way you got ahead was by serving the customer and being more customer focused. So, and let me very quickly add though, something we didn't discuss yet, is, is, and it's, it's very germane to how people lead companies. Um, not only do Apple people, are, are there not a lot of politics, but Apple employees also have an odd or, or unique bargain with the company, which is that it is, you understand as an Apple employee that it is all about Apple and it is not about you. And I, I'm fascinated by this topic because it seems kind of obvious that's what we, that is what you would want as a shareholder, that is what you'd want as a customer for the, for the employees of the company to be focused on the, uh, the greater good and glory of the company, not on their own brand, their own personal careers. And then I'll just sort of leave it to you to say how many companies do you know where that's the case, where even very senior managers have no public profile because they, all of their energies are focused on the company and its brand, not theirs. Hi. Um, so, I, I, Adam, in your book, you made a point that Apple was very well integrated, um, to which I agree. But Clayton Christensen, uh, one of the foremost leaders in innovation, disruptive innovation, predicted that uh, this integration will set Apple up for failure. Um, at, it will make it difficult for Apple to respond to a disruptive threat. Um, I mean, so what are your thoughts? Do you believe that you know that um, Apple is somehow going to f uh, fail in the future that it will not be able to respond to the lower disruption? So first of all, when did he, when did he make this prediction? Uh, just last week. Really? Okay, I didn't see it, so I. Clay always predicts everything's going to die, and, his, and his, by the way, his track record is terrible. Just to Clay, I. I, so Clay set up a fund um, during the boom to try, this is true, to try to, um, and, and I respect Clay, Clay is one of the leading academics, but Clay set up a fund during the boom, the old 2000 or 90s boom, to try to figure out which firms would be disruptive. It, it lost so much money they had to close in about three years. So his track record, he's good retrospectively, but his track record in predicting who's going to fail is not very good. So I, I would not put your money there, but but and we'll let Adam take this. But but I do think Clay has a point that if the world changes absolutely suddenly uh, because they're so integrated, that it's going to be hard to shift quickly. Here's the observation. First of all, I'm not a student of of, of his, um, and he most certainly is not a student of Apple because no one, no academic is. They won't let any other than the ones other than the ones who are employees. It's an it's an important point. 
So he's just spitballing it, and that's fine, and he's a, he's a very bright guy. Because of their integration, because it's a command and control organization, they are able to turn on a dime, and they've done it many times, and senior executives will say that Apple is able to, to turn the aircraft carrier very quickly. Um, that's because so few people are making the decisions. So I don't think the danger is, of their is from their integration. The danger is from the fact that can the current executive team see these, these paradigm shifts as well as Steve Jobs saw them. But I don't think that their structure will prevent them. If anything, their structure enables them to be far nimbler than any other company its size. Yeah, I, I would say the Harvard Business School could move, will move much more slowly if there's ever a radical shift <laughs> than um, Apple could because there's more centralized command and control at, at Apple. And it, it is funny, by the way, Clay for years has been predicting that Harvard's biggest competitor is the University of Phoenix. He hasn't been doing too well. I mean, the University of Phoenix is doing okay, but, but, I, but I, I love Clay, but his ability to predict the future is suspect. We need to come over to this side of the room for the next question, unless someone already has the microphone. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, David Needle, Tab Times. Robert, uh, this idea of the no assholes rule, I wonder if you could talk about the uh, leadership of Steve Jobs and where his robbing people was a pro or a con, yeah. and then where does Tim Cook stand on the uh, asshole? Well, well I, I, I know less about Tim Cook, but uh, when, well, first of all, when I was writing the no asshole rule, um, I, I, there was a conversation had more than 100 times, which is that people would come up to me and they'd say, uh, but what about Steve Jobs? Is right. just sort of, and, then, and then they tell me a story about what, um, what an asshole Steve was and how successful he was. And, um, and, and so I would sort of add uh, two things. The first thing is, is that um, from sort of, sort of an asshole perspective, so the way I define an asshole is somebody leaves people feeling demeaned and de-energized. Um, if you're all asshole all the time, it actually doesn't work. And one thing that Steve did have the ability to do was to turn it on and off as necessary to charm the person in front of him. And, and, and then the, the other thing, and this is about American society, is, is that in American society, uh, let's take Bob Knight in basketball. If you're a winner, um, it turns out that you're allowed to act like that as long as you keep bringing in the money or winning the games. Uh, that's, that's our society. And, and my perspective, at least from what I can tell third hand from Jaws, but also from people who are friends who say, if you use my name, I'll shoot you, um, that, that there is some evidence, um, despite some of the weirdness in Isaacson's book, that as he started having kids, as he started having, you had mentioned Bill Campbell was a very important mentor for Steve Jobs, and he sort of got to the point where he started relying on other people and was less of an asshole. But nonetheless, if you're going to be an asshole, and I've had a number of CEOs say to me, um, do you have to be an, an asshole to be successful? There's certain rules I would suggest. Um, number one is you got to be successful all the time because your enemies are lying in wait to shove you out the door once you start failing. Uh, the other thing um, is you better have somebody to clean up the mess behind you. And Steve always had people to clean up the mess behind him. And, and then the other thing that I've already said is people who are effective assholes tend to be reasonably strategic. They know when to sort, and there are times in life when you want to leave people feeling demeaned and de-energized. Uh, maybe when he attacked Larry Page, that was a part of his goal was to make, make Larry feel bad about the Android phone. And then there's other times when you want to make people feel great, like I said with the Tom Porter story. So, so, so I talked about Steve in my chapter on the virtues of assholes, and there was, there was a reason. But my response is, He's still an asshole, and I'd rather not have a world where, where people like that are allowed to get ahead, but such is the world we live in. Based on my reporting, there's little evidence that Tim Cook is an asshole, and there's a lot of evidence that he is not. He is uh, said to be extremely tough, but um, the word that keeps coming up is gentlemanly. Mm. If not kind, gentlemanly. So make of that what you will. Yeah, okay. I have a question. Um, it looks like a go back to private question. <clears throat> I think you need to give people hope, like uh, how to fight with Apple. Right now, I think, how, as you agree, uh, said, Apple is hard to duplicate, right? You need a steel job and a uh, good team, Apple, for like a couple of years, people work for interest, not for money. Then there were, and the third thing, I think, uh, Apple's success is because of bad marketing. Because in bad marketing, people cannot compete you, because you have a strong army, right? 
The market is small, you can easily kill other people. But when you think about the industrial value, after the market turned bad and good, how people can learn from Apple and compete with Apple? Right? I think it gives people opportunity. Like maybe people can learn from this one and then you know, we can uh, encourage creative work. Like Apple right now, the people don't really talk with each other. Actually, this is against, the, uh, I think, the Silicon Valley culture, right? People each talk with each other, idea and share with each other. So, my good point is that from your point of view, how we think about other guys have opportunity after the marketing turns good. Thanks. I'm not trying to how what's the opportunity once the once things are doing better, what's the opportunity to compete against Apple or to be more like to emulate Apple? Which, which yeah, I think at least the like of give us opportunity like uh, what I compete and uh, you know I think uh, what do you think about what we can get opportunity from like good marketing? Well, the marketing is a perfect example of, of, of Apple's uh, excellence and, and, and in a very simplistic sense, it's not fancy. It's, it's not radical or maverick. It's just very good. It's, it, it's, it's very clear, that it's, it's on point, it's, it's beautiful, uh, and, and, all, and all these things. And I think the, the biggest barrier to the biggest barrier to being more like Apple is that most companies have far more products than Apple does, and they're far less clear about what their products are. And you you can do the most you can do the most beautiful marketing in the world, but if you're marketing confused products and you're confused about what they are, you're not going to do a terribly good job. About, uh, of doing yeah, yeah, I I think that's a great point. So just I was just trying just recently to try to figure out which HP printer to buy. Like, come on, look at the list. How do you know? It's like I can't, there do must the be same, like do the, fifty of them. You can do the same thing with all-in-one computers at HP. I, I know this from experience. I helped my father buy one. They have ridiculous names. There's far too many of them. And then you go to the you go to you go to Apple.com, and there's basically four kinds of iMacs, right? Two two size monitors, two size processors. It's not that complicated, really. And and and, and at, by by the way, as a general rule, which you get from Adam's book and from from other places, including Clay Christensen, to say something nice about Clay Christensen. It is, is this notion of your job as a boss is not just to kill all the bad ideas, it's to kill most of the good ones too so they can focus. And that's something that came through your book and everybody who's ever dealt with Apple. And it's really hard to kill good ideas because what happens is you do crush people's ego a little bit who came up with the ideas and you cause frustration. And, but in the end, you end up spending your money on too many different things. You end up with products and services that are so complex nobody can understand them. So this, you know, this point it just seems completely obvious, and yet. Okay, we have time for two more questions. So this question is more for, for Bob, since you're writing the book on um, accelerating innovation or excellence. Yeah, spreading excellence. Spreading excellence, right? So based on the people's experiences at, at Apple who have really have done great work, do you expect like a large number of centralized successful startups and mentors coming in the future from people who are there right well, now? Well, I, I think we got them already. I mean, let's look at Zynga. Uh, Facebook is, I, I, Facebook's a company that actually will talk to me. I actually have a great deal of respect for Facebook, but, but in the end, Mark Zuckerberg makes a decision about what goes on Facebook. And so, so we're already seeing them, and I think that we also saw them before. I think, I think that having, uh, well, you go back to Intel in the old days under Andy Grove. Andy Grove, I think, in many ways, he encouraged debate uh, in a lot of ways, but very centralized leaders. So, so I, I think this is nothing new. So, so my question was, like, do you expect companies from those top 10 or 100 who Steve Jobs picked? He means you see uh, Apple, uh, Apple, the Apple alumni network starting. Oh, I, I think I think you're more well qualified to describe. As I understood it from at least your book, that it turns out that the Apple alumni network has not done a particularly good job starting companies. Is that true? That is true, but I, I but it is changing. I believe things are changing. Short answer to your question is yes. I, I think it will be a, a very exciting next ten to fifteen years okay. of, of activity from the Apple alumni. Partly because they're no longer concerned about competing against Steve Jobs, but but only partly. It's just it's time now. They, people stayed there an unusually long time for a variety of reasons we don't have time to discuss. That's one of the reasons you didn't see much of it. I think you will see more. So, so the, the counter argument is again from Adam's book is that well, 
if you were giving full management responsibility and you were just told to make this absolutely perfect, as opposed to, let's say, running a business at Hewlett Packard, I, at, at one point, uh, John Freeman, a professor at Berkeley, did like, like an analysis of how many companies were started from HP alumni. It was unbelievable. And that's because HP, from the very beginning, would develop you to give you a full range of management skills from the, really the first year or two you got there if you were a high potential engineer. And, and, and uh, so we're not developing overall general managers at Apple, as I understand it from Adam's book. We'll see. My, my gut tells me these are very bright people, and like Steve, they will hire well. Or, or poorly, but they'll try. That, that's, that's Maybe you're right. I'm just presenting the alternative yeah. hypothesis. Very last question. Uh, so Apple has uh, more than one product line. You keep comparing Apple to Facebook and to Zynga, but both these companies, they have like one single core product, like Facebook is just one. Facebook. Yeah, perfect. So is there any other company that has more than one product line that's run as centralized in a centralized way, such as Apple? No, I don't think that's a, it's a completely fair statement in that uh, Zynga has you know, multiple titles now. They're more You could say they're only one game studio, but they have uh, it, there's quite a bit of divisionalization now in that the biggest properties have, have become pretty big fiefdoms of their own, reporting up to Mark Pincus. And um, I would argue that Facebook has a lot of things going on now, too. A lot of different things under development, even though there's only one product. But anyway, to answer his specific question, now, that's I, the same question I was pounding in on earlier, right? What about, what about Amazon? What about it? Would, you, would that be an example? Um, almost as centralized, almost as secretive, and a multiple product lines because they have the Kindles, etc., in addition to the, to the shopping service. I believe that for many...